Hi everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk to you about hybrid artificial neural networks, uh, which I believe to be the future of deep learning. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. So first, let's just do a quick review of what exactly is deep learning. Um, so deep learning relies on these things called artificial neural networks, which essentially attempt to approximate the behavior of the brain using simulated neurons and backpropagation. Um, so there's many different kinds of artificial neural network. Um, the most basic kind is a fully connected network, uh, which presents a problem called the vanishing gradient problem. Um, this is a problem with the backpropagation algorithm that we talked a lot about in class. Um, you can reduce the effects of this problem uh, by structuring the neural network's uh, connectivity more efficiently. Um, basically what happens with the vanishing gradient problem is um, there's so many connections in the network that it produces some entropy. And as you go back in the layers of the network with the backpropagation algorithm, uh, you lose a lot of effectiveness in actually determining what the backpropagation uh, needs to do. Um, so this idea that we can kind of structure uh, an artificial neural network's connectivity instead of just having a fully connected network um, is basically the process of deep learning. Um, so we're kind of cutting down on the number of connections in different ways in order to make the network more efficient. So there's a couple of different kinds of network that are used really commonly in deep learning. Um, there's a CNN, or Convolutional Neural Network, which sort of, we've talked about this in class, uh, it attempts to mirror the structure of eye neurons with sort of a localized uh, sensory field, um, which basically allows you to really cut down on the amount of entropy uh, in the system. Um, there's also a recurrent neural network, which uh, has neurons that have a special function inside of them, which allows them to retain information over time. Um, there's a special variation on this that we'll talk about uh, later called a long short-term uh, network, and those can be really useful. Um, and now there's another kind, uh, which we've also talked about in class, uh, called the autocoder, which is essentially a neural network um, that is able to learn to compress and decompress data by essentially putting it through a little tunnel um, that's very, it's a very thin layer of neurons um, where the data is pushed through and over time the network learns to sort of like train itself to compress that data. So on their own, these kinds of networks are all better than a traditional fully connected neural network. Um, but the theory is essentially um, that you can combine these concepts to make neural networks that are way more effective than individual uh, versions of these networks. So this concept is called a hybrid artificial neural network, and it's a pretty new concept uh, that is really just being explored very recently. So here's a picture of the main academic article that inspired this paper. Uh, it's called A Deep Neural Network Model for Short-Term Load Forecast Based on Long-Term, Short-Term Memory Network and Convolutional Neural Networks. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful, uh, but basically what we're talking about here is um, this network is a pretty basic hybrid neural network. Um, and essentially what they're using is the convolutional neural network, which we talked about in class. Uh, that's the one that replicates the visual system. And a long short-term memory network, which we didn't talk about in class, but it's essentially a, uh, a variation on an RNN, or a recurrent neural network. Um, so what they did was pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, um, they were looking to forecast uh, load in an electrical system, which is basically the amount of electricity that's being used by the overall system. Um, it's really, really useful to be able to do that, um, to be able to predict when the spikes are going to happen. For example, you know, maybe there's a big sports game that everybody's watching, um, and everybody turns on their TV at the same time, and there's a huge load spike. Um, power companies need to allot certain resources for these times, so if they can predict when they're going to happen, uh, they can save a lot of money. Uh, even like a really small percentage change can save them a lot of money, so this is a really useful thing. Um, so essentially what they did in this experiment, if you look on the next slide, is uh, they created this framework for a neural network, which combines on the left a long short-term memory network with a convolutional neural network on the right. Um, so 
Interestingly, they actually found that their model uh, that they used here was significantly more accurate than a traditional neural network, uh, even and even performed a little bit better than the Google DeepMind project uh, for this specific application. Um, so what are like the implications of this? It's actually uh, really tremendous um, because even a slight percentage boost in the accuracy of one of these load prediction systems can save millions of dollars uh, from a company's operating costs. And there's really a lot of money to be made uh, with predictions that can be this accurate. So it's obvious that this paper has some really interesting implications. And it seems like if we can use these neural networks uh, in ways where the different methods that are out there can be combined, it seems like we could have a really, really effective system that's way more accurate than anything we have in the past. Uh, so what does that mean for the future? Um, well, one idea that uh, I would like to propose is that you could have a very effective uh, system if you use the ideas behind a convolutional neural network as a basis, but then use that to go a little bit further and try to replicate uh, even more of the visual system. Um, so this diagram here looks a little bit confusing, um, but it's quite similar to the one on the last page. It's essentially the building blocks for a neural network system. Uh, so if you look at the bottom here, uh, we've got two um, essentially pathways which are meant to replicate the, you know, loosely replicate the visual pathways in the brain. Um, so you've got camera one data and camera two data, which are sort of meant to replicate uh, the like inputs to the system, which would be your eyes. Um, so essentially what these two data blocks are is just two matrices of data, just big chunks of ones and zeros that are going into the system. Um, and then using the localized connections that we've talked about with convolutional neural networks, um, these uh, data chunks are processed uh, in tandem by these feature layers. And those feature layers have, uh, like what we talked about before, that sort of uh, proximity data processing where they take uh, chunks of data, much like um, the neurons in your retina, and they take these chunks of data and sort of uh, use them to detect like edges and curves and things like that. Um, and so that's a, that's a localized connection. Um, and then if we move up a layer, we've got these uh, layers which are called pools. Um, these are also very common in convolutional neural networks. Um, essentially, uh, they're fully connected to the feature layer um, and they process the data from the feature layer, sort of combining it. So maybe the smaller uh, features are like a curve and then in the pool, it combines a series of curves into a circle. So that would give the, um, the network the ability to process um, data that is a lot more complex, um, combining multiple features into a larger object. Um, and next comes the bridge, which is sort of taking the data from both sides and combining it into a, a greater idea of what the, the system is looking at. Um, so the benefit there of having two visual pathways is that you have a slightly different angle on the object uh, from both sides. So the hope is there, the theory is that you would be able to construct a three-dimensional idea in this neural network of what the uh, computer is actually looking at. Um, and then next, after that, uh, the data gets run through a long short-term memory um, layer, and essentially what that is doing is taking that data and comparing it to uh, data that has come in in the past. So maybe um, the hybrid network is looking at a rotating cube, for example. Um, it would be able to tell that the cube is moving based on the data that it's seen in the past, because you, know, you see it from one angle, it moves a little bit, you see it from the next angle. Um, and so you want the network, again, to have an idea of what it's looking at. Um, and the recurrent uh, properties of the LSTM are going to give it that ability. Uh, next, after that, um, we can use an autocoder to compress that data. Um, and this is really useful um, if we are, for example, building a camera system. Um, you could have multiple uh, cameras all over the place, and 
use them uh, in combination with these neural networks to recognize and compress data into a much more conceptual um, idea of what exactly it is. And then that data can be sent out in its compressed format and decompressed in some kind of central hub where the information is processed and uh, a decision is made about how to react to it. So we've been talking in very broad terms here uh, about these systems. Uh, and this leaves a lot of questions about the specifics. Uh, for example, how exactly does this system learn? I mean, it is possible that you could do it through traditional backpropagation. However, you would probably want a more effective system if you were going to um, use this in a practical sense. Mostly because of these ideas we've talked about before in class, where backpropagation is not really the whole picture. I mean, we're only using the outputs of the data to learn by. We're not learning anything from the inputs. And really, when we draw conclusions about what's in the world around us, a lot of that information is coming from you know what we see other people do, sort of replicating that. So it's important that we learn a lot more from our inputs than from our outputs. So there's a big question left there. I'm no mathematician. I can't uh, you know, give you a definite solution to the vanishing gradient problem and say, yeah, this, you know, this is what we can do instead of backpropagation. But I can point us in the right direction here. I can say, OK, if we use these hybrid artificial neural networks, we can leverage the things that we know so far into much, much more effective systems. And this is just a proposed model for something that I think could replicate the visual system in a way that would make it much, much more effective. Uh, and there's no reason why you couldn't have more than two uh, visual pathways in this example. Uh, there's no reason why they couldn't be auditory pathways instead of visual pathways. It's a very flexible model, and I think it could be really, really useful uh, going ahead into the future. Um, so I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Again, this is a, it's a very broad topic. So um, please let me know. Uh, there'll be a comment section on this video. Um, you can post whatever questions you have in there. Um, if not, you can also email me um, or message me um, in some fashion. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions, and I would be happy to answer them. Uh, so in general, just Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I think the future is really bright when it comes to these artificial neural networks. And there's so much more to be discovered. Um, and they're a really, really interesting part of cognitive science. So I hope you'll come along on this journey for me. Thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.